Hi guys, um, in this video we are going to discuss something called intermolecular forces. First we're going to talk about what that is, the three types of intermolecular forces, and how you can predict the type of intermolecular forces experienced by a particular molecule. So recall, if you will, what a bond is. We just got done talking about those in the last unit. Bonds, ionic, covalent, and metallic, are the forces that hold atoms together. Bonds are sometimes referred to as intramolecular forces. Um, so let's look at that word, intramolecular forces. Intra means within. So intramolecular molecules are forces within a molecule that hold the atoms together. So let's say we have a simple molecule here, um, the molecule AB. Um, so you have atom A and B, and the force of attraction that holds those two atoms together is an intramolecular force or a bond. So let's say we have a collection of molecules. Those molecules will then stick to each other, um, and you will find that there would be a force of attraction that happens between the molecules, and that force of attraction causes the molecules to stick to one another. And that force of attraction is called an intermolecular force. So an intermolecular force is defined as the forces of attraction between molecules that cause the molecules to stick to one another. So this is why we can have, say, a glass of water or a glob of oil, or even, you know, you, or a dog, or a sewing machine, or a pen. These things are all made of molecules, and those molecules are certainly all stuck together to make larger samples or collections of molecules. Let's look at the word intermolecular force. So the word inter actually means between. So these are forces that happen between molecules that cause them to, to stick to one another. And these are the same forces of attraction that are responsible for tape being able to stick to a wall or a gecko being able to climb up a wall or um, things mixing with each other. If I took alcohol and I poured it into water and I stirred it around, they would mix. Or if I took sugar and I dissolved it in water, sugar dissolves in water um, by being attracted to the water molecules, and that attraction is an intermolecular force. It should be noted that intermolecular forces are weaker, significantly weaker, than the bonds that happen between atoms. So just remember that. So there are three types of intermolecular forces, and the type of intermolecular force will depend on the polarity of the molecule. So we'll break it down. There are two types of molecules, those that are polar and those that are non. And so we'll start with the intermolecular forces that can happen between polar molecules. All right, so let's use a hypothetical molecule, AB. So it's just two atoms bonded together, and this molecule is polar with a, a slightly negative charge on this B and slightly positive on the A because the electrons are spending more time around B. So let's look at a collection of these molecules. Because these molecules have dipoles, they each have a positive or a slightly positive and a slightly negative end. The slightly positive end on one would be attracted to the slightly negative end on another. And you would get this force of attraction between dipoles. This sort of attraction is called a dipole-dipole force, and it's defined as the attraction that happens between the positive dipole of one polar molecule to the negative dipole on another adjacent polar molecule. It should be noted that dipole-dipole forces are significantly weaker than the force of attraction between two ions. Um, and the reason why is because ions are um, have 
a total charge of either positive or negative, whereas um, dipoles are only partially positive and partially negative. So that makes the force between polar molecules weaker than the force of attraction between two ions. So we just got done talking about dipole-dipole uh, forces um, between polar molecules. Well, there is a special type of dipole-dipole force, so a second type of intermolecular force that occurs between polar molecules that is a special circumstance um, between molecules that contain hydrogen um, bonded to either oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. And this type of intermolecular force is, like I said, a special type of dipole-dipole force. And it's called hydrogen bonding. As an example, we're going to use a water molecule. So water, when you have a collection of water molecules, water is a very polar molecule. And when you have a collection of polar molecules, you will find, of course, that the negative end of one water molecule will be attracted to the positive or slightly positive end of the other water molecule. So you're going to get these forces of attraction between the slightly positive um, end and the slightly negative end um, of each of these molecules. And these forces of attraction are dipole-dipole forces, just like we discussed, but they're a special circumstance of dipole-dipole force called hydrogen bonding. You will notice that water molecules all contain hydrogen atoms. And these hydrogen atoms are bonded to oxygens in this case. And it turns out that in molecules that have hydrogen bonded to highly electronegative elements like fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, those hydrogens have their electrons taken from them or pulled away from them in a really polar bond inside that molecule, which makes the hydrogens in this molecule not only slightly positive, but almost ionically positive, um, as a positive as those hydrogens are ever going to get in any molecule. And so that makes the force of attraction between the hydrogen in one molecule and the slightly negative end of the other molecule, that hydrogen bond um, is a very strong dipole-dipole bond. And that makes the hydrogen bond stronger than your average dipole-dipole force. Um, you will also find that hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the intermolecular forces. In fact, water experiencing hydrogen bonding makes water um, have all of the properties that water has. Um, that's why belly flops hurt when you go into a pool of water and you belly flop and it makes your belly all red. It hurts because you're breaking the strongest intermolecular force that you can break, this hydrogen-hydrogen bond. Here we should note, this is extremely important, that even though we call this hydrogen bonding, um, that bond, it's not a true bond. So hydrogen bonding's not as strong as the actual bonds that happen between atoms, ionic, covalent, or metallic bonds. Hydrogen bonding's not a true bond. We just call it this, um, I don't know why, it's just what it's called, but it's not actually a bond. Well, not all molecules are polar molecules. There are plenty of molecules in the world that are not polar, like oil, for example, or carbon dioxide or hydrogen gas. Um, these molecules are not polar, yet you can still have collections of these sorts of molecules. So think of oil. You can have a bottle of oil that's made of millions or thousands of oil molecules that are clearly all stuck to each other because there's a collection of them. And um, that collection of molecules has to be attracted to each other somehow. And that force of attraction, that intermolecular force of attraction between those nonpolar molecules works slightly differently than you would find the force of attraction working between polar molecules. So as our example of a nonpolar molecule, let's use just a really simple molecule like hydrogen gas, which is made of two hydrogens. And these two hydrogens are attracted to each other um, 
you know, with a very nonpolar bond. And that nonpolar bond um, that you find between two hydrogens means that those electrons are being shared roughly or pretty equally between the two hydrogens. And so that means the electron distribution around these two hydrogens is roughly equal on average. But you can imagine that this, this bond is made of two electrons. And those two electrons are not stuck in one place. They're actually just located in a region between and around these two hydrogens. So that means that at any moment in time, those two electrons could be closer to one hydrogen than the other. And that would make that hydrogen um, have more electron density around it at that particular moment, which would cause for just that moment in time, that hydrogen to have a slightly negative charge on it compared to the other, slight, the other hydrogen, which would be slightly positive. This is called, or this is a temporary situation. It's a temporary dipole, meaning that it doesn't last. Um, this, these two electrons could then move again and end up over by the other hydrogen or um, roughly equal between the two, and then that dipole goes away. So what if this molecule isn't alone, right? It's near or in the vicinity of another H2 molecule. And, it's, and this you know, hydrogen molecule has its temporary dipole. Well, that means that the electrons here are going to push the electrons in the other molecule away from them and induce a dipole on the other molecule. So now you've got these two nonpolar molecules that have temporary dipoles um, that aren't going to last for very long, but while they're close to each other, um, that's going to allow them to then have a force of attraction between this induced or temporary negative charge on the end of one and the um, temporary positive charge on the end of the other. And you can imagine that if you have a whole bunch of these molecules or these hydrogen molecules nearby, you're going to get a whole bunch of induced dipoles that again are temporary. These type of intermolecular forces between nonpolar molecules are called dispersion forces. And remember, they're temporary and they're induced dipoles and they don't last. In fact, the second you separate those two uh, molecules from one another, they'll go back to being nonpolar. Um, it should also be noted because of that that these are the weakest type of intermolecular force. And it should also be noted that all molecules actually experience dispersion forces to some degree, um, but this is the only type of intermolecular force that allows nonpolar molecules to stick together. All right, so lastly, let's discuss how you can determine or predict the type of intermolecular force that a particular molecule would experience. So to do this, you would have to first draw the Lewis dot structure. Um, you can't get around that. You have to draw the correct Lewis dot structure. From there, you could use the Lewis dot structure in the shape of the molecule to determine how polar it is. So is it a polar or a nonpolar molecule? If the molecule ends up being polar, then it will experience dipole-dipole forces. Um, it could also experience hydrogen bonding if the molecule contains hydrogen bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen within the molecule. Um, if the molecule is nonpolar, um, it will only experience dispersion forces. So let's run through a quick example. Um, we'll do NH3. So the Lewis dot structure ends up looking like this for NH3. And because this is um, a trigonal pyramidal shaped molecule, um, it actually looks something like this. So you need to determine the molecular polarity and its shape is part of that. And it turns out that um, the bonds are polar, so the nitrogen ends up slightly positive, whereas the hydrogens end up slightly, sorry, nitrogen slightly negative, whereas the hydrogens are slightly positive. And that gives this thing a polarity sort of um, towards the nitrogen in the direction of the nitrogen. 
So this is, yes, a polar molecule. Now, because the molecule is polar, it will experience dipole-dipole forces. So you can say that it will experience dipole-dipole forces, um, but you would also want to note that um, there is a hydrogen in this molecule that is bonded to, or there are hydrogens, and those hydrogens are bonded to this nitrogen. And that makes this, because you have hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, that makes this molecule highly polar, about as polar as you're going to get. And so that means that not only are you experiencing dipole-dipole forces, but you're also going to experience, or rather this molecule is going to experience hydrogen bonding with other molecules.